this is um, the first Peabody Research Office brown bag. My name is Craig Kennedy. I'm the Associate Dean for Research, and I've had a pro. And it's been a few years since we tried the brown bag series at Peabody, but I thought we have all this wonderful research that's going on across the different departments. And since we're in different buildings, we don't always get a chance to interact and hear about the new innovations that are occurring. So we thought we'd start a brown bag series this year. Uh, and invite people who are doing exciting new research to talk about it with other researchers. Um, and that a brown bag forum was a nice, casual way of doing this. I'm glad to see people have brought their, their lunch and so on. Um, we've got four presentations this fall. We've got today's presentation, which I'll introduce in a second. On October 6th, we're going to have Lyle Jackson talk about how, how to capture quality audio and video for research, both in terms of capturing video for data analysis, but also for communicating research results to a larger community. Um, then in November, we're going to have a junior faculty only brown bag, uh, so no senior professors allowed, and it's going to be on writing and submitting extramural grants. We've had a request from the junior faculty to have a, 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 a kind of a, a, a group of just younger people who are going to ask a lot of questions about what an IDC is and why do we have the direct cost rates and so on. We're going to have Mark Lipsy and Kaiser and Leon Schauble come in and, and do a Q&A with them. And then in December, we have Paul Yoder, Joe Webby, and um, John Tapp from the Kennedy Center come in and talk about recent developments in their Moose's observational system, which builds in lag sequential analysis technology and like really is at the forefront of lag sequential analysis. And that's our roster for Cox this fall. We're hoping that it's successful. We have a turnout like this for each event. We'll continue it on in the spring and into the foreseeable future. Uh, our presenters today are going to be talking about paperless data collection. And they're headed up by Dale Ferrett, Professor of Teaching and Learning and Senior Associate Director mm -hmm. at the Peabody Research Institute and a longtime valued Peabody Hall. Here. <laughs> well, we're, we're very excited because uh, we think, I think this is, we think this is a great thing that Craig is doing. Um, we absolutely are very excited about the new Peabody Research Office and that it can have this kind of function, not just sort of be a conduit for grants, but actually have a function of getting together people to share ideas across projects and think about things that can be co uh, collaborated on and uh, in information that can be used. So we're very happy to be here. And I want to recognize at the very beginning Ralph Knapp. <laughs> who uh, uh, was, has been with us all the way, sometimes sort of dragging us back and other times <laughs> pulling us forward. Uh, but he's been, a, he's been an invaluable colleague. And I think it's an example, again, of what Craig wants to do, which is to get this sort of technology underway of thinking about how to do more exciting things with technology and, and these new adventures. And so we're very grateful to Ralph for his help. Uh, but we had so much to talk about among the four of us that we just couldn't give Ralph a forum. So, uh, uh, for those, some of you may not know, um, uh, we are the Peabody, we're not all of the Peabody Research Institute, but the, the Peabody Research Institute was created in the fall of 2008 by Dean Bimbo. Uh, we didn't actually become operational until January of 2009, and in case this is a new idea to you, we are an interdepartmental research institute within Peabody. And our goal is to study and improve the effectiveness of programs for children and youth and families. Uh, we are very different from what LSI was. We are a research center. So we have a relatively permanent core staff that includes senior investigators capable of writing fundable proposals and serving as PIs on funded research. But in addition, we consult with other faculty who are interested in our expertise. So since we were formed in January 2009, we have already brought in $11 million in external grants uh, for our own, and we've assisted other faculty across departments in procuring external funding. And we are now 33 full-time staff and associated doctoral students. And we are right up there. So we're on the fourth floor of this building. When you come to Wyatt, there is only one fourth floor. It's on this side. Try to get to the fourth floor on the other side, you go to the roof. So here on this side, if you're looking for the fourth floor, that's where PRI is. And on the elevator, it says Peabody Research Institute. So you'll know you're hitting the right button. So come see us. We're, it's a very exciting place. So I, I 
am a, a professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning, and I have a secondary appointment in Psychology and Human Development. But uh, I agreed uh, to the, with the dean that to become the senior associate director of PRI. Mark Lipsy is the director. Sandra Wilson is here as the associate director of PRI and senior research associate. Dina Metter is a project coordinator with us, and Elizabeth or Beth Morhas is a project coordinator with us. So you'll you'll hear all of us as we go along. Let's give a little background on this. What is paperless data collection? Well, it is this new procedure that we've developed for field-based studies. Doesn't have to be, could be a lab, but we're using it for field-based studies. Um, that uses tablet computers to input data rather than traditional paper and pencil. We don't use paper and pencil. We are against paper and pencil. We actually take paper and pencils back up <laughs> in case something terrible happens. Uh, we're now using it in three large studies at PRI, including one study with a distant site in North Carolina and one study that covers the entire state of Tennessee. This period of time right now, the next two months, we will assess something like about 3,000 children and across those sites using paperless data collection techniques. And we will be in around uh, 100 classrooms, 100 plus classrooms, doing some of the observations that Beth's going to talk to you about. So let me just tell you this perfect storm of how all this came to be. Um, first of all, we, Sandra Wilson had already developed a system for data entry that was that used and was based in FileMaker. In that, in that, the screen that our data entry people used on the computer mimicked a score sheet to minimize errors, and she'd also used it for other things. But in terms of what we're talking about, child assessment, the screen looked like a score sheet, so it was easier to go back and forth from entering your data to putting it on the score sheet. Then we hired Dina, and Dina secretly purchased a tablet computer because she was convinced that you could actually collect these data on the computer with a tap system and avoid the move between paper and screen. And it took her about a week, and she just came in and brought it and said, look what I think we can do. He said, yeah, we'll never you have a job for life. Um, and then we began working on a newly funded project, which was the most com we do a lot of work on curriculum evaluation. This was the most complex curriculum we had ever seen. The amount of paper it would have taken to try and, and the difficulty of getting reliable in a classroom with this complex curriculum that changed over the had many components and changed over the year was going to be almost impossible. We struggled with a few for a few months until Dina came in with her surprise, and Beth turned to thinking about doing this electronically. And suddenly we learned that we could do all our observations electronically, and that in fact, for this curriculum, it probably was only possible to do its fidelity electronically because of the complicated nature of it, and you'll see. So what are the benefits of, for paperless data collection? Well, you you actually save money. There's the upfront cost of getting the machines, but you save money. You get more accurate and, and effective data collection. Every time you have to go from paper to, every time you have to go and transfer your data from one system to the other, you have human errors. You just, you just can't avoid it. And it's, as you all know this, you're all researchers, it's really hard to go back and, and fix them, especially when you find them months or years later, and you were very upset with yourself. Um, and there's a reduced environmental impact. So, for this one, the first time we used it was last spring, with about 560 children. We estimated we saved 8,000 extra data entry costs. That's not to count our own staff time, so that doesn't count what data entry actually costs totally, but we would always hire extra people to do a data entry, and we didn't have to hire them. We figured we saved about 17,000 pieces of paper, uh, 92,000 pieces of paper for the life of the project. We saved checking for errors, data ent double entry. We always double entry all, enter all our data. And the cleaning of the data, which usually takes three to four months. So for this project, our data collection ended mid-bang. And by June 7th, Mark was presenting it 
at NICHD in a working conference on this very topic. Astounding. <laughs> to us. Okay, here are the other benefits. Uh, stay with all the things you save on. All the things you have to buy. Right? We're not buying filing cabinets anymore. Unless we can help it. Sometimes people want to buy filing cabinets. <laughs> <laughs>
you just look up the teacher and it automatically will show you every child in her class. You print it out and hand it to the person going out to the, the class. Or you can look at it on your tablet when you go out to the class. Um, we use this for mail merges with emails to the teachers or principals. We use it to save time during data entry. It's really handy to have the structure built in. Um, and it's video proof, which is great. Um, so all of our field-based data collection and our in-house um, meta-analysis coding, we build in checks to make sure that people are doing it right. And, um, and so that means we have set fields that will only take certain answers. We have help screens built in. Um, these buttons can link to a larger PDF manual if you wanted to read up more on some of the observational things that we have. Um, we have um, kind of set answers that if you answer one question one way, all the others have to fill in a certain way. So it will populate the screens for you. And um, some of the other features, this is one that we've just developed. This is the beginnings of a teacher survey. And each teacher would go in and log into the system and she has a list of her students. And then as soon as she completes the survey, the text changes color and the words change so then she'll know which kids she still needs to go in and do or which ones she hasn't finished. That was really groovy to figure out. <laughs> it is really groovy. Um, and all of this we do in the database. This is done with scripts. And so once we get a handle on the scripting technology and how to make these scripts, whatever we can imagine doing, we can do. You just have to figure out how to do it. And so um, this is for the color coding, the warning signals. I mean, they have scripts that will make the computer beep at you when you do something wrong, which is really neat. Um, for choice responses, we have a lot of calculations and little simple mathematical things that are going on in the backgrounds. Um, the navigation to the different levels, which Beth will show you a little bit about. And then exporting data, we can totally automate that. Okay, so demonstrations. So um, the first set of demonstrations is going to focus on our assessments, so the things we do with the children. And, um, and Dina's going to talk about that. And this is going to illustrate for you some of the, kind of the neat features that we've built in. So, when we do some of the achievement tests, there are ceilings that tell you when you're supposed to stop for each child, and she's automated those into the system so you know if you've reached the ceiling or not. And, um, and then some of the other techniques involve error messages that will show up on the tablet or color changes that kind of give you a sense of where you're supposed to go as an assessor. And then the observations. The uh, classroom observation of preschool is something we do in the classrooms where the observer follows the children around the room. So you watch a child code and go to the next child and code and go to the next child. So there's a bunch of different screens that you kind of, or a bunch of different items that you fill out for each child very quickly. And we have it kind of set up on the screen so you can kind of tap through and then your data are there. And it'll take you automatically to the next child. And then the fidelity instrument, this is our most complicated, multi-level branching setup that Beth is going to show you how that works. And that's kind of the end of my story. Now you get to see the fun stuff. So we have to switch them over, right? Yes, so take just a minute. We'll swap over to the tablet and walk through some of my childless mm -hmm. And we, we're going to leave time at the end for questions. So if, if, if your brain is just Whirling away with ideas, if you want to, then hold on, we'll get to you. While they're doing that, let me just say, not all tablets are created equal. <laughs> um, we've played around with different tablets, and we need ones that can tap with a stylus, and we need ones that can, that can take and recognize handwriting. Uh, Lenovo is a lovely little tablet can do neither of those things. So you, you have to really figure out what you want, and then if you are going to get tablets, you need to make sure the tablets you get will actually do what you think they'll do. Did it come up? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
banana. So you will see as this goes through, for this subtest, our ceiling is three, which is written up here in this blue box. You'll see my total score for this assessment is three. That's how many she got correct. The number of items that we completed is six. Now this is a check for our assessors that when you finish a Woodcock Johnson subtest, if I end on item six, this box should say six. If it doesn't say six, then you've missed an item somewhere and there's a blank in your scoring or you've skipped something. So you'll know to go back and fix that before you leave. This is really helpful because you're right here with the child. And if you missed a question, you can you can fix it right then. It doesn't have to be coming back and then a week later realizing you're going to have to go out and pull the child again. And then the ceiling calculated three. So this resets itself when a one is selected because you have to have consecutive zeros to count as the ceiling. So for the next item, for seven, if she had gotten a one, it would restart my ceiling over again. So that's what Wood Cotton Johnson looks like. And now we'll move on to a couple of the self red measures. Because I have some different things built into those that I'd like to show you guys. <coughs> this is a measure called DCCS. It's a card sort activity. And we're just going to do the first part of it because it is kind of lengthy if she gets all the way to the inmate. <laughs> so let me flip over to the sure next one. And the tabs that you see at the top of this is the order in which our assessors give the assessment. So they would start with the cover page, put their ID in, and then move to the next activity. And they would go sh straight across that as they're assessing because they're in the order that they're given. So I put my date and my initials, and then I'm ready to get started with that. I didn't bring my script book, so I typed out this just a little script. It's a little bit lengthier in, in real life. Here's a red truck. And here's a blue star. Now we're going to play a card game. This is the color game. In the color game, all the blue ones go here, and all the red ones go here. See, here's a blue one, so it goes here. If it's blue, it goes here, but if it's red, it goes here. See, here's a red one. If it's red, it goes here, <laughs> but if it's blue, it goes here. So now it's your turn. So remember, if it's blue, it goes here, but if it's red, it goes here. Can you show me where the blue ones go in the color game? Can you show me where the red ones go in the color game? Okay, let's try this game. If it's a blue one, then put it here. But if it's a red one, put it here. Here's a red one. If it's a blue one, then put it here. But if it's a red one, put it here. Here's a blue one. If it's a blue one, then put it here. And if it's a red one, put it here. Here's a blue one. If it's a blue one, then put it here. And if it's a red one, put it here. Here's a red one. If it's a blue one, then put it here. And if it's a red one, put it here. Here's a red one. If it's a blue one, then put it here. And if it's a red one, put it here. Here's a blue one. And she put that in blue, but I'm going to pretend that I forgot to mark that answer, so I'm going to show you guys what happens if you leave one blank. Now, she had only gotten two at this point, which I hadn't scored that last one yet. So I would go over here to the other side for the shape game, and you see if you don't get five out of six correct, then you don't move on to the next game. So I would check this box, and it's going to bring me up a message that tells me I left an item blank on the color game for me to correct and then continue. And I can just hit my box and then go back and fix it. So that's just an example of how you can get error messages, and those are custom messages that you can write to say whatever you want them to say. So that's been very helpful this time. Um, Beth and I saves us a lot of energy when we're importing the data and checking it to know that those checks are built in, so it's less likely for people to miss an item as they're going along. Then this assessment is Corsi Blocks. It's um, kind of a visual backward, forward digit spin type task. So I'm going to move up here and we'll go to the score sheet for this because this one does some of the color changing that Sandra was talking about. So I'll show you what that looks like. This was, is a really complicated um, score sheet when you look at it because the four courses, so the children will get an item that has two digits. 
if they miss that item and, and are not correct, then you move over to the second side over here. But if they get it correct, then you go straight down. So having this on the tablet has been really helpful with the color changing, which I'll show you. It makes it a lot more clear as you're going through as to what you should do next. So we'll walk through this. Let's see if you can do what I do and touch the same blocks. Good. Try this one. Now those are practice items that we do with the children that we go to school just to make sure they understand what we're doing. And now I'll start with the first practice item. I have my keyboard out here too, so in case she gets one wrong, I can write it. So now that she got that one correct, I would just go straight down. And now we get into the actual test items, and this is where the color changing begins. So there's not any reason on this measure that you'd ever stop on the practice items, so the colored items are built in when we get to the actual test items. And she did two eight instead, so we're having our sisters capture that, and then I'll put a zero. And you'll see the block at the end of that line turns yellow, that's cautioning me that if she doesn't get the next one right, then we're finished with this portion of the assessment. So then I'll move over to this, to the 4-9, and I'll give her this one. And she got it right. So it turns green, letting me know that I go on because she did get it correct. Had she gotten another zero, it would turn red and let me know that that's my stop. So we'll go on. So again, I get the caution light. And she missed it again, so it lets me know that I stopped. So this has been really helpful. Again, when Beth and I go through and check, the children get assessment one, two, three, and four, and you move on to the next one once you hit that red light. So when we are going through looking, we know that there should be red lights for each of those, and if there's not, then it calls our attention to it, so we double check it. One thing that I built in also with this, because this has a lot of items, it actually goes up to, I think, nine digits forwards, but that we don't particularly get to so much with our pre-K children. And <laughs> as you can imagine, we don't get to with some adults maybe, but, um, so I built in at the bottom here, where you had, so that everything would fit on this screen, the part that the assessors are likely to need. If you were to get to the last item that you have up top and the child got it correct, then you could go down here to the bottom and the additional items that you need are there for you to use, but they just don't have to be in the way and you don't have to be looking at them unless you need them. So that's the cool things that we've built into this um, to really help ourselves for the day coming back in and to help the assessors when they're out in the field so that while we have that child right in front of us, we can fix any issues and we don't have to make trips back and pull a child again and kind of start over while it's fresh. So I thought that I would take you through with the information that I just input in here that Beth did and show you what our assessors actually do with the data and then what we do when it comes back to us. Each of our assessors have a name tag that they wear out to the schools and they have a thumb drive that's attached to the back of that. This is the only thing that they bring us. Um, they keep their computers throughout the whole assessment phase and they charge them the night before. This is all that they ever bring into the office. So I will show you what it looks like to save and then I'm going to import it into a fake main database that looks like what we have on our server here that I actually import the data into. So we ask all of our sisters to go back and check their work before they save a copy so that it's exactly like they want it to be before they bring it back to us. So you go up here to File, you go to Save a Copy <coughs> I'm going to select my thumb drive. And we have a naming convention that we use for our files where it's, we have two sessions of assessment. So we have an assessment group for session one and one for session two. We have them name their file by their session. 
their initials and the date that it was given so that we can go back to the roster and know that Beth was out at Coles Ferry on August 31st. So if I need her information from that date, I pull up the file that says session one Beth on that date because she's going to only have been at one school and I know that's the information that I'm trying to find. information on my phone drive, which is exactly what the assessors do when they're out in the field. Now I'm going to go ahead and close out of this database. And then this is my simulated main database that I put on here. It's not exactly what I have. This one is not linked up to the children as our one on the server is. So I have scripts that are written in for us to do our imports. And I'm going to find my file on my thumb drive that I just placed on there. And it's going to bring up all of the fields. Now for this, because it's a simulation, there's not exactly the same information that I normally have. I'm going to go ahead and hit import import her information and it's going to tell me that I have one record that was added which is correct we only did one child today and then when we go through you're going to see exactly I did Corsi blocks with Beth I did DCCS and I did academic knowledge and all of the information that I input in is what shows up on the screen so it's as easy as that instead of bringing back pieces of paper and then having data entry and then double data entry and checking that against each other for errors we have exactly what they put in. There's no room for me to interpret someone's writing incorrectly or anything like that. So that's what the import process looks like. Now for our assessors, what was kind of some safeguards that we built in to make sure that we don't lose any data. When they're out in the field, their score sheets automatically have their data saved until you physically delete it. So they save their copy on their thumb drive and they bring it to us. It's still on their computer and it's on the thumb drive. Now the thumb drive, we take it and put it in a folder on our server so that we have their original copy and then we import it into our main database. So it's in a folder on the server and it's in our main database. And then if we don't see any problems with their data, with their data when Beth and I check it, then they can delete their records off their tablet. But until then, until we've checked it, there are actually three copies floating around. And then when we finished the self-regulation project, I pulled all of that whole folder from the server off and put it on a thumb drive that we could keep external from all of our hardware just in case something happened. Yes. So, and that was, I mean, that's, that's the whole part that I had to talk about. But as Dale mentioned, so this perfect storm kind of took place right as we were developing this very complex curriculum measure that Beth is going to show you. And we went out and started doing it on paper and realized that it was really difficult. So this kind of hit it the perfect time. So I'm going to pull this up for Beth and let her start talking about that. You want You want You want, you want comp first, right? So the first one that's going to come up is our child observation and preschool measure that Sandra spoke of just briefly. Um, this is an observation tool that we take into the classroom. We spend the entire morning in the classroom, usually from 8 to 12, 8 to 12.30, and observe each child individually. Um, we start that by identifying each child and then um, watching them for three seconds and go from child to child to child, gathering data. Each, each look at three seconds, we're um, scoring across or coding across nine dimensions. So if you can think about this, this is a lot of information to be gathering um, across the morning for four and a half hours or so. And the way we've done this um, up until this upcoming observation cycle is with paper. So this is actually what the observer would walk into the classroom with, with a pencil, and start by identifying the teacher over here. we got a teacher in a black and white sweater. And then they would flip a page, and they'd start going down the class. And so I'd identify a female here in a green blouse. And I would flip my page, and as you can see, this is getting to be really fun. Um, we identify everybody, and then we start observing. 
And so I would start after I have 20 children in my class because our average pre-K is to have 20 kids. We start and we watch the teacher. So I'm back here on the top, I code her across. And then I left. Usually there's an assistant, so I would code her. And then I go to my friend in green here. I'd watch and see what she's doing. I would code her. And we continue to go. As you see, we have 20 times that we look at each child across the morning. This is a lot of paper and a lot of flipping and a lot of going. So when well, a lot of reinforcement things that we have to find. We start tearing them. So as um, this was being developed, the tablet forms were being developed for the assessments. Um, in the back of my brain, I said, you know, there's got to be an easier way to do our observations where, um, one, we wouldn't be writing all morning long, and two, it wouldn't be um, so hard on the paper and um, just making it easy for our observers. So here's what we came up with. It is um, exactly like what we did on paper, but there's technology that has assisted our observers in making this whole process a lot easier. So when um, we would open up this um, form, we get our class, and we I started to identify here the class, the teachers. Um, on top is the teacher, and I just identify by the description. If you go down to the one that doesn't have a kid on it. Um, so I would um, write, take my writing identifier and put my child's name in. We will have IDs that will do the same thing our IDs with assessments do when we're up and running with observations. Just pick up a name there and um, identifies the child, and then I would say, okay, this is a female in a blue shirt. Something that I can identify the child with, and I would do this for the entire class, identify all my children. We have consented children in our classroom, so I would be working with the assistant saying, who's Johnny, who's, um, who's Sam, all the way across the classroom. And then I would be ready to start my observation, so I would go to the first one up on the very top, it says jump to, and I come up with my screen. And I would um, then look at my teacher, watch her for three seconds, and start the, the coding process. This, like the um, assessments, is a drop down menu, um, and it, I just click whatever I need to click. You want know, to hit time first. It always clocks in the time. I'm going to do the name. Yeah, the name's fine. And uh, so it's 1229. The child was not talking. And no, to nobody, it's an NT. And then you can just make up as you go across there. Um, and they go just drop down on each one. And it's set so then she would click the little next button and would go to my next, and this actually is the assistant. And we, we continue. I would code that and just go ahead and click next. And just so you don't have to keep coding. And then I get into my children and doing the same thing. What is really wonderful about this, on our um, clipboards as we were out there, we had our cheat sheet on the bottom with codes that are set, that if we saw something in the classroom, we knew that this was always something that we would um, code. And what we've done with the um, tablet is set those codes in. So if um, you code NA in interaction, you go across just NA, mm -hmm. everything codes out for our observers. So no longer are we writing as fast as our little fingers can write N A L L N N. Um, we get it by putting it in. So that all of our set codes are in, in this process also. Um, what's also great is if you go up to status report, we come back and we can identify which children have had the sweeps. If there's a one in the sweep, that means that child or teacher has had the a completed record finished. If it has a zero, that means A, we either missed a blank, or B, the child wasn't observed in the first place. So we can backtrack and make sure we get everybody in the classroom. So this was, the, for us that have, have actually done the COP many times, it will be a much nicer, easier, smoother route to go. And we're not writing every single thing down, and we can catch our mistakes while we are there, so we can watch that child one more time. So it's, it's a benefit all the way around. With paper as well as the technology. So we're going to jump now to our fidelity measure, which is the complex system that Dale spoke of, Sandra spoke of. Um, the curriculum we are validating right now is called Tools of the Mind. It's a pre-K curriculum that is very different from any pre-K classroom you've walked into 
in that it builds on the children's experiences as they go across time, scaffolding their behavior, and it's a change in curriculum. Whereas you might be teaching something one way um, this month, next month you'll be teaching something completely different. Um, our challenges when we saw the curriculum at first was it was four thick curriculums that we had to, each portion of the year, had something different we had to learn and have to figure out how we could um, determine if teachers are being faithful to the curriculum. We were looking at fidelity. And so we have uh, come to this in many layers. Dina spoke of trying to do it before we got it to computer. This is a notebook with the actual curriculum in it. And it would be 59 paper pages on the fidelity portion of the curriculum alone. So if you wanted to identify something, we'd have to tab to an activity. Then we'd have to find page through until we found the activity we were looking for. And doing it on paper was going to be next to impossible. We have done most of our curriculums that we've looked at in the past, we have done them on paper that we flip maybe a few pages and can get to the point we need to get at. But when you're talking about 59 different activities that we have to identify components of, there was absolutely no way to do it on paper. When we walked out the first time having done it on paper, we all looked at each other and said, uh -huh, this can't happen. And so this is where we went. Um, what Dina has is the cover page set up. We've already answered the questions um, that the observer would have. And again, this goes from 8 to 12 in the classroom. And the first part of our um, observation is what's called a narrative record. And we will do this in both control and experimental classrooms where we document every single thing that's going on in that classroom. And as you can see, the first one, at 8 o'clock, the children were doing timeline calendar and a whole group on the carpet. Uh, we would be coding across this and writing. One of the wonderful things about the tablet, and we've just upgraded to the Windows 7, is the writing recognition. And so if we are getting ready to watch a class and they were doing timeline calendar, but now they're doing weather graphics, so I have to change to my next line of my narrative. Um, Dina will first hit time, so we have a time block happening. And then she will type right in, in detail, what's happening. Children are doing the weather. Teacher is uh, talking about the weather. Anything that's going on in the classroom. And as you notice, it's uh, reading or writing. The recognition, writing recognition um, develops with you. I do all sorts of weird things when I'm doing narrative because I'm writing so fast. I do, of course, the width with the slash. I do um, ands. And so it just picks it up. As soon as she wants to insert it, she can go ahead and tap the insert. So you can just about write anything and you get pretty sloppy. The first time we used it, we put a pencil in Dale's hand. <laughs> she was trying to beat the computer and she couldn't. She, I mean, it was writing and it was popping up. It gets better with process as you're using it. That's why um, when we assign our assessors, observers, computers, we let them keep them so the writing recognition is developed for them and not somebody else. Um, another nice feature of this is you can see there's all sorts of different things that we're coding. We're just coding the type of activity, the content, the instructional level, the teachers, the engagement. We have to um, train people to be reliable on this measure. We go out in pairs, we practice reliability. Um, but sometimes you get out there and you're going, oh my gosh, what was instructional level three? So Dina put an easy button on there for me. Um, we go up and tap our easy button, and we get basically the manual. Um, beforehand, before this lovely computer happened, here's our manual for the fidelity. You can see, again, a lot of paper. They will still get this because this is a bigger version. But they can get to it easy in the classroom where they can tap and say, oh, that's right, my levels of instruction are important um, to know the different ones. And as you can see, she, they are tabbed again up on top, so all the different um, components can be um, hit. So you can, if an observer in the field is questioning what's going on, they can uh, go ahead and, and find an answer to their question right then and there and, and continue their observation. There's all sorts of buttons to get us back to where we started. Um, for our fidelity portion of this, we have constructed what is called the tap. And the tap is, we call it tap because you're tapping a lot of things. So if, if we actually are in a tools classroom and we see, for example, weather graphing, we would tap large group because that's when it happens. So I can close your writing. You know. So this is one of many, as you can see, all the little tabs 
that are showing up here. Um, but in large group, in a tools classroom, all the activities here on this side are the ones that can happen um, while you're there observing a large group. Um, and we wanted to know what teachers were doing for fidelity. Which one, which activities, first of all, there's so many activities, which activities were they choosing to do? And once they were doing these activities, were they doing them correctly? Were they doing things that they should not be doing? Um, and so we could compare teachers across our classrooms. And so this is what comes out. Dina has clicked my weather graphing, so I have my screen for weather graphing. My teacher um, did allow the children, for example, to say what the weather was like, so I would tap it. Um, she marked the weather on the graph, and then the teacher and child read the graph. We tapped that, um, and she used her mediators, meaning things that help the children remember what these activities are, and she used sticker dots, but she didn't use picture cards. Um, also, there's should not, things that we talked to the curriculum developers and said, what shouldn't happen in this curriculum? And uh, so these are things on weather graphing, they said it shouldn't focus on more than two math concepts and it shouldn't have like the weather person of the day where one person was the weather person. So in this case, my teacher did it correctly. So now it's time to move on. We go back to the narrative and we can continue doing the activities, writing the activities that are going on and scoring them, coding them appropriately. But every time a activity pops up for the tools in the mind, hit um, make a loop play. We go back to another layer and identify each one of the things that are happening across the time. And as you can see, each page is different, and hence that's why our notebook gets really big. If you can imagine trying to find weather graphing in this notebook, um, I probably could find it just because I know the curriculum. I could give a guess, but if I handed it to one of my friends over here, they would be like, where, and, and we have to train, we are, as Dale said, this is the distance project. We are training people in North Carolina to do this without any knowledge of the curriculum to start with. And so what you see on this page is what the curriculum developers say is the way that this curriculum is supposed to be used. And um, that's the only way we could sit back and figure a way that all of us could be looking at the same thing and mark the same things that are happening. Yeah. And, and so what we've besieged you with here is um, uh, a, a variety of ways. And uh, let me just mention one thing that we're getting into. Sandra talked about it. Um, we do have these distant sites. Uh, we have this issue that we work with teachers and they, they have their children nested within them. We went round and round, and Ralph was helpful on this, in trying to figure out, could, can we do uh, data entry uh, online? You have issues with confidentiality. You also have issues of nesting. So one of the systems that the, the medical school uses wouldn't work for us because we couldn't actually have a teacher only pull up her classroom. So we don't need them to pull up everybody because they don't have everybody. We just need them to pull up their classroom. And then we need to have the files encrypted for coming back to us because they're making judgments about their, about their children. Um, we are giving uh, our teachers now a bonus for doing, doing it online and like, you know, digitally. Uh, so we're going to see how this works. But uh, we, we think with Sandra having found the file server and I working on this that we've worked through the issues of being able to get, but it's going to be a little complex. Every teacher gets a, um, her own ID number and her own password, and that gets her into the system. And so then she, then her her classroom comes up, and then she sends it back to us. So I, I think there's so many applications for thinking about this. Once you stop thinking about working on paper, <laughs> that, that there's just no end to it. So questions, comments, ideas, ways you want to apply it. Go, Bruce. Um, I, I think it's great for conservation for. <laughs> we're, we're in schools today, and I, I was kind of worried about all of this paper that's coming back and how it's going to get coded. And I've had a lot of experience with, I mean, bad experiences with really big, important studies that you really count on, you know, having 12 different types of standardized scores for kids. And we get to the end of the study and we run the whole thing, and we don't really get any of the results that we were expecting in some of the sanity checks. And then we go back in the data and we discover that there are little mistakes here and there that, you know, somebody put a raw score versus a standard score into a data, and 
go back and you know spend that eight thousand dollars for all of the data entry double coding, and then all of the mistakes rise to the surface, and then you go and arbitrate each one, and then after the arbitration, you do the hell analysis again, and suddenly you find these great scientific findings <laughs> that didn't exist before, and we could have closed the books on it, but it was all because of this critical juncture of you know from the moment of the data coding to when it gets into the analysis, and so. We've done things that have been a little bit like this, but not not quite as to this level. And I think this is great, I and mean, this is a big advance to the extent that we could get everybody doing this. Um, in my NSF proposal, we suggested using little handheld PDA devices that would bring up kind of one question at a time with a big you know yes or no, and then it would go to be smart enough to prompt you what the next question is. And I was wondering if you guys had thought about you know how you reduce human error on this or reduce the cognitive complexity of somebody who's in the middle of a field, you know, of kids with all this information looking at a really crowded, you know, scoring machine like this, whether you could find ways of like increasing the user friendliness of this or, or whether you're getting experience getting feedback from people saying, once you've done this a hundred times, right. I mean, there's no crowding at all, but like the, the brain yeah. injury and you're training people, like how do you use this device and get it all straight? Practice, for one thing, but I think when I started creating these databases and having people use them, um, mostly for meta-analysis, mm -hmm. it was a matter of, you know, asking people, having six people open it up on their computer and walking around at their desk and looking at how it looked, because it looks different depending on the size of your screen, so making sure it all fits. And then having people use it and tell me. You know, having the button all the way over here was inconvenient. Yeah. Or, you know, if the if the color was different here, my eye would go there. You know, so just asking people. And the more you use it, I think the more you figure out how to make it work. Like this, you know, changing the color and the more rows you add, it stripes so your eye sees better the different rows. And, um, and the one where we're observing the kids and flipping, when it's a teacher page, it's one color, and then it's a child, it's another color, and then when you go back around to the beginning, it changes back to the teacher color. So you kind of, those kind of things, and it's just a matter of seeing the mistakes people make and then revising to when fit. We, when we did it in the field up in the spring, we literally, every time we had suggestions coming in, we would, if they were suggestions that were going to work, we went ahead and changed it and re-ran the run times on the uh, Cessor's computers so it would match to make it e much easier. And we knew, so this fall when we started with the new set of assessment measures, we, we, knew, we knew some new keys and things that would work. For example, the color coding and the ceilings did not exist last spring for us. But we realized, hey, this is a way to make our jobs easier and make the assessors uh, a little more foolproof. Which is really nice. Uh, one of the things that since we're running this on FileMaker, it's something that we can modify. It doesn't come through a programmer and something we would have to go back to someone else to fix for us. When the assessors have those comments or things that they'd like to see, we just do it. And it's really quick and easy. But it, but it does mean, unlike paper and pencil, that you need somebody in-house who can make these kinds of changes for you, but also what we've discovered is, um, <laughs> I'll use state as an example, when we, we started tw training 20 people who were going to work for us part-time, these were all uh, educated and bright women but who hadn't worked, and the, the test for whether they could, were going to be successful on this was whether they knew what a thumb drive was. <laughs> all right. Yeah. There were some in the room who had not a clue what that was. So you are talking about having a, a variety of skill in the people that you're trying to have use this. And you have to have somebody around who can train and who can respond. Screens go blank and people panic and they have to have somebody they can call who tells them what to tap to get them get it back again or if there's a genuine problem and they and can discriminate if they need to switch to paper. And so it isn't it isn't uh, it doesn't work without consultation of your of your assessors and your observers. Anything else? Carrie. <laughs> I just have a question about what you said, Beth, about the writing recognition that it evolves with a user. 
Um, so when you get it back, can you reset it so that it will evolve with the next user new? Do you know what I'm saying? Like if it's... It, 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 it just is continuation, so no, it's not okay. the reset. Okay. But, but it, it adapts to It'll the adapt. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, as it goes along, it's going to adapt. To the new user. Cool. I didn't know it did that. No. <laughs> you can program in you know, words that you frequently use. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, we really appreciate your being here, and yeah. if you feel like, you know, hanging out and looking at and holding up the tablet yourself or looking at it, please do, but otherwise, I think we've had a great time, and thanks, Craig. This has been wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.